we fundamentally have this gap where practitioners need to upgun their leadership abilities, especially in large AI activities. And then there are a large number of leaders who might have a technical background or they may just be leaders in the mission and have no technical background, but they can become AI leaders. And Chris, we'll just make a quick background note there on you. Any of your peers or colleagues would regard you as a data scientist. By our definition, you are not a data scientist, but you have learned to be an extraordinarily strong leader in this space. And we hope that encourages people. This is AI for Leaders by AI Leaders. Practical, to the point content, helping you drive results with AI. Here's Chris and Frank. Welcome to the AI Leadership Podcast. I'm Frank Strickland. I'm Chris Whitlock. Chris, before we jump into today's episode, which is going to focus on using your career to help leaders develop AI leadership in five areas, let's mention that we have a resource on our website. It is an 83-minute lesson that you and I deliver that focuses on chat GPT and LLMs. And it is free of charge. Just go to our website, AILeaders.com. But there was yet another abuse of chat GPT <laughs> this week in the legal community of all places. Uh, what happened? Uh, there, There's a great article and the story has evolved, but the essence of it is uh, a 30 year legal professional in filing a brief for a particular facet of a case that he is representing, used chat GPT to generate a substantial portion of the response as well as legal citations. And uh, he fell into an entirely predictable problem with this output that if leaders will simply understand more of how these models work what they do and the potential pitfalls can be avoided. But yeah, I would say uh, for us, Frank, that one resource, it's useful to orient people. Uh, this is one of the hottest things going in AI right now. And there is a tremendous amount of misunderstanding and there is an enormous amount of attributing capabilities that don't really exist uh, to these, to these uh, solutions like uh, GPT, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And that video gives, I, I think, uh, some of the essentials that you need just to think about usage in your organization. Yeah, I would say this, Chris, I wrote this on LinkedIn this week uh, as you were posting about that case. We would say to leaders and those of you in our community who are advising leaders, especially senior leaders, you, you have the following options regarding large language models and chat GPT specifically. Uh, you can get training for your organization on how to properly use them. Don't use our training. Go get someone else's. We don't care. Just get training. Um, second, you can just shut them off, which JP Morgan did. Okay. You're not using this. And, and uh, JP Morgan is one of a number, by the way, who do not allow that on their enterprise systems or, or laptops, et cetera. Yeah. We won't name them, but we know companies in the national security and federal space that, that have done likewise. So you can shut it off until such time as you feel like, you know, you can use it safely. Or the, here's the third alternative, and you can get the passion in our voice here is these sort of gigantically avoidable, stupid, and harmful uses of this technology keep occurring. You can be derelict in your duties. So you just decide which option that you want to take. But that lesson is there. Chris, one other bit of exciting news for our community. Uh, we are going beyond that lesson uh, soon to actually offer a short course uh, on large language models, and that course is for leaders. So we'll say more about that uh, in the coming days, but just stay tuned for that. All right, Chris, so let's pivot. What motivated me to do this in part was Data IQ's Top 100 recognized you this past week as one of the top 100 people in the data and AI space. So congratulations to them. you. Yeah, yeah, that was that was kind of them. 
congratulations. Um, let me, before we dive into the five areas where we suggest those who are AI leaders or aspiring AI leaders uh, develop themselves, let me mention two caveats here uh, based on my 30 plus year history of working with you in this space. One is, I have not personally worked with anyone that combines your capability in leading advanced analytics and AI with unpretentiousness. In fact, you're, you're so lacking pretentiousness that you can be a pain in the ass about things like having this conversation. So just for our community, know that uh, I kind of had to browbeat Chris a little bit to have this conversation. But No uh, aspersions on dentists, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that might rank more highly than yeah, spending this time on this yeah. topic. But I, I get the importance. I do get the importance, uh, Frank, and happy yeah. to have the chat. Well, and here's the encouragement for our community. We put this in our book, and we talk about this in our courses in terms of the leadership gap. Uh, Secretary Work, Bob Work, has talked about this um, from the perspective of the NSCAI report and the need to develop talent and develop leaders. We fundamentally have this gap where practitioners need to upgun their leadership abilities, especially in large AI activities. And then there are a large number of leaders who might have a technical background or they may just be leaders in the mission and have no technical background, but they can become AI leaders. And Chris, we'll just make a quick background note there on you. Any of your peers or colleagues would regard you as a data scientist. By our definition, you are not a data scientist, but you have learned to be an extraordinarily strong leader in this space. And we hope that encourages people. Just real quick, Chris, your undergraduate degree is in what? History. History. History and, and political science. Yeah, I can remember actually working on that in in the early 80s. I was trying to decide what to do, and I... I used a tool that was common in the day, still is used, it's called the Strong Interest Inventory. But the three top things for me were um, military, law enforcement, and engineering. Those were the topics <laughs> that really fascinated me. But, you know, as you're navigating school, I did time in the military. Part of that was on active duty. Part of that was in uh, the National Guard, uh, component two of the Army. Um, and the engineering part just, it, it didn't seem realistic and viable to me at the time. And I had a lot of passion about, uh, history that was just long standing. So I took my maths up through calculus. Uh, I took different programming classes, which were relevant in that time. And now I kind of chuckle about, um, for I even ran, I was the administrator for, um, the the computer lab that we had in one of my schools we ran an ibm uh, system 360 uh, mainframe there and yeah i've always loved the technology part uh, but that wasn't what i pursued in my undergraduate degree i did not pursue an engineering degree i didn't pursue a yeah stem degree as we would mm -hmm. construe it today or steam degree so great example then, as we go into these five areas, that those who don't have engineering backgrounds or computer science or, or software engineering or data science or math, one of the hard STEM disciplines, you can learn to lead this work. So let's go through five areas, Chris, and we're going to cover these thematically. We're going to talk about your career, but we're not going to do it historically. We're going to go through five areas where we feel practitioners and others that want to develop that are not in the data science and AI space, they need to develop themselves. And the first is just analysis. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just get a fundamental definition. I'm going to make an analogy to strategy here. I, I teach a competitive business strategy course. You and I used to do this in the company that we started Edge Consulting. If you stopped any professional 
and kind of gauge their confidence in whether they know what strategy is or not. Uh, confidence would be pretty high to really high. Then if you ask them to write down a three by five card a definition of strategy, eh, uh, might be an inverse correlation between their confidence and their actual clarity. So let's just get some clarity. What, what do we mean when we say analysis? Uh, to me, it's the body of techniques we use to decompose problems, whether to understand performance, understand what's driving uh, performance. But an analysis effectively, and there's a wide variety of forms uh, from survey type activities uh, through to the high end, the data science type uh, analytic work, it's fundamentally breaking down problems to understand uh, performance, uh, causes, drivers, uh, et cetera, and the reciprocal synthesis. Can, can I, once I've decomposed a problem and I understand, can I bring that back up uh, to some level that's pertinent in storytelling and decision-making, et cetera? So a lot of resources out there uh, to help people sharpen their fundamental analytical skills. But Chris, one of the techniques that, that we are a big believer in, you mentioned decomposition. And I remember an email that you wrote when you were leading a lab of uh, quantitative analytic people working for me back when I was in the government. You wrote this this epic tome on analysis and you were really encouraging people to upgun their analytical competency. And the phrase you had was decompose and differentiate. In the differentiation, one technique that, that we have found and continue to find, you know, week by week, month by month, still useful is the technique of, of MISI. Uh, what is that and, and how is it applied and useful? Uh, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. It's just a fundamental framework when we look at complex problems allows us to break apart the pieces, look at their rel relative contribution. Uh, but when you're trying to analyze something that's really complex, it's easy to not be careful in doing that. And it makes it hard to perform useful analytics and without throwing big things under the bus like the national intelligence priorities framework which i would <laughs> never name but there are things that are out there that get used commonly and they are not messy and there you attempt to use frameworks like this in order to manage enterprises. So you come back to strategy, I have some set of goals, there are big activities that I wanna proportionally resource uh, in order to, to make progress. If you don't carve out what the priority space is in a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive way, you're going to leave holes or you're gonna double up on things you don't intend to double up on because you called the same thing uh, in reality, three different things in labeling, and you can end up resourcing all of them, and it just creates problems. But to me, it's a basic indicator of how well a person can structure their thinking. Can mm -hmm. you take a complex problem and can you break it into piece parts that are entirely separate, but when taken together, represent the totality of the decision problem or the analytical problem? And it really helps with that companion technique, Chris, that you mentioned, synthesis. I can remember to give our listeners an illustration of how widely this analytical principle can be applied. You were working on what at the time was the largest AI proposal that uh, Deloitte went on to win in the federal space. And there were some follow-up questions. And there were dozens. The questions might have numbered over 100 and what did you do with the answers, the questions and the answers in order to apply MISI to synthesizing? Wow, that's a trip down uh, historical <laughs> lane. Yeah. Uh, so we, what the government had done in this particular instance, I guess would not be uncommon in that you had a source selection uh, activity, a technical evaluation board, each member had articulated a number of questions that they wanted answered. And yes, in total, there were like a hundred uh, of them. But when uh, I began to study these with the team, it became pretty 
apparent immediately these were sourced from multiple people. And so we created a structure for answering them. We uh, portioned them to mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive blocks in content. And so rather than answering, which some other firms did, each one in turn, because they spoke to the same issue just with slightly different wording. And so, yeah, others literally were answering effectively the same question uh, three and, and four times. We grouped them. We grouped them thematically in a way that was me -see. And, uh, yeah, we got big plaudits, actually, from the government in, at the end of the day on the way that we structured that. And it became a tacit indicator to them of how we thought about mm, complex yes. problems. Yes. Yeah, it just sharpens your thinking. Good analytical reasoning sharpens your thinking. And as you just illustrated— it has a connection to the quality of your storytelling, the quality of your communication. Now, Chris, if people want to go a little bit deeper into that, we'll just mention those who have a math background will, should immediately resonate with this. If you don't have a math background, just go do a little bit of reading on this front, and it will help you. Uh, if you look at the problem of collinearity, uh, when you have weighted criteria and you're doing some type of weighted criteria model, uh, multi-attribute utility, that sort of thing, a lot of people get themselves into quantitative problems in that they're not following the rules of MISI and they inject collinearity into the model. So if, if you don't have a math background, just take a little bit of time, look at collinearity. It will help you understand this. But Chris, that segues then to kind of the last question around analysis in this first area. You developed uh, strength in quantitative analysis. Uh, you, you, you had some math in your undergrad, as you mentioned, although I kind of quickly note, you know, you went to Ole Miss. So, I mean, how good could the math be when you're stomping your feet and counting on your fingers? But um, you developed a body of quantitative analytical capability. Kind of how did, how did you do that? How did that come about? Well, I would say that I probably had the experience that a number of people have with maths in that you get exposed to these things in your schooling, but in application on work, if you don't immediately move into a role where you use it, uh, that certainly can atrophy. Um, <clears throat> for me, I've come to this belief that at the end of the day, for much of the work that goes on in the kind of spaces that you and I have worked in, if you have a good understanding of algebra and algebraic interactions, and then you have a good foundation in statistics and probability, you're solid. All right. Th those things are required. Uh, certain of the maths are crucial for bodies of very advanced techniques that we use in this space. Uh, and they're certainly relevant in engineering applications and design applications where it's, it's critical to evaluate performance trade-offs. Uh, calculus and the related families are, are really important there. But for me, uh, I went through a period where a lot of my work was more around text and analyzing complex military problems. I kept an oar in the water because my initial time after school was with the Central Intelligence Agency, and I began that in the imagery analysis world. And uh, while imagery many of us can relate to just literally looking at an image and interpreting what is in an image, and there was a 12-week course we progressed through to learn about the fundamentals, it's not as straightforward as it might seem. There's a quantitative element to that referred to as photogrammetry, and that's how we make measurements and derive details 
from a photograph collected from an aircraft, uh, spacecraft, even ground, uh, the photogrammetric applications are necessarily quantitative uh, and tend to be in that geometric uh, space, trigonometric space. So one of the areas that kept m me active, uh, I was trained in a system called the light table mensuration system, <laughs> LTMS, and that was uh, something that we used to make measurements rapidly. It was an innovation at the time to allow imagery analysts much more quickly to do what before had to be sourced to experts in-house on particular kinds of gear in order to measure and make determinations. Uh, this was, uh, in effect, an intermediate capability. Um, it brought me back to C programming, which I had been exposed to at school. Uh, we refreshed that and then had to learn the application. But that was the limit of it until I hit the 90s in this lab and statistics became really crucial, statistics and probability. And it really became apparent to me at the time, okay, this is where I've got to concentrate. I'll take future classwork here. I want to read and expand my understanding of those two disciplines. And I would view those as foundational. Mm. So we would just exit this area and say to our community and for those, again, that don't have a, a stat background, uh, Chris has mentioned it several times. You could go to Coursera or Udemy, uh, any number of online sources, and get an introduction to statistics, descriptive statistics, inferential statistics. Inferential statistics are very important foundationally as you segue into types of machine learning. And just doing those two, descriptive stat and inferential stat, would really be helpful to you. And there are some excellent uh, sequences of lessons uh, and courses that you can take in areas like Coursera free of charge. All right, Chris, so the next one we would put tremendous weight on, we'll spend less time on it, but we would say domain learning has been essential to your career and is essential to any AI leader's career. Why would we say domain knowledge? Well, first of all, what do we mean by domain knowledge and why would you say it is essential? Uh, that's the mission area that you're evaluating and the broader context of what you're analyzing. And it is probably one of the leading areas where people can run off the rails in any kind of advanced analytic work. You want to drive yourself to understand the mission and the piece parts expertly. So for example, when, when I first met you and we met in the space community, I had not focused on that. I'd been an infantry officer in the army when I was a military analyst at the agency. Yes, I worked with images derived from that, but I did not concentrate on spacecraft or things of that nature. I was concentrating on targets and questions that policymakers had, and that had very little to do with spacecraft attributes. When I met you in the National Reconnaissance Office, it suddenly became all about that. So I went through a reading program on my own around our evolution in space. I, there were books that I read, there were movies that I watched um, to learn more about space and the the factors that drive performance in space, what we can do from space in different dimensions, uh, meteorological, communications, sensing, etc. And yeah, that's what we mean by domain learning. Uh, it can be any facet of the problem. It can be the way that if it's a military context, it's the way that our forces, the blue forces, operate, organize, are equipped. It can be the adversary. How are they organized, equipped, and operate? Or it can be these other types of technical issues. But you have got to drive yourself to learn. And I, I would say as a principle, learn bigger than the immediate task. Mm. And it's a temptation when you're young in career. I have a job to do. I'll do my job. And that's kind of where I limit it. Punt that. Uh, you want to learn bigger than your job because you're learning for the next 
big conversation, the next thing you may be drawn into. And if you have constrained your learning and the limit of your attention to the immediate tasks that are put upon you, it's just massively, massively constraining as far as career goes. And I am thankful for that. I would attribute it in part to family, but have just always had an interest in learning bigger and reading more broadly, uh, contextually and otherwise. Yeah, great illustration of that, Chris, just to personalize it to you. Your dad told me this story. We're at dinner and uh, you're just preteen and he takes you to uh, see a movie. I think it was Battle of Midway. And he thought, OK, great. You know, Chris is going to be really excited about this because you've had a love for all things military since you were a small child. And uh, get a few minutes into the movie. You look at your dad and go, Pfft. This is horrible. And your dad's kind of crestfallen. And he looks at you and says, what's wrong? And, and you say, they didn't have that gear in theater when the battle was fought. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah. is, it is interesting, though. I, I believe that, you know, people who I have known in my career who really do well, they learn aggressively about the broader mission area and they learn aggressively about how different parts of the enterprise fit together, construed broadly. Like we talk about whole of government in a lot of foreign affairs and, and even in military context, the whole of government. Well, what is the whole and how do they contribute and what is the role of state department? State Department, or how does even does justice play mm. uh, in particular mission areas overseas? That's to me that is domain knowledge, and if you limit yourself to learning by what you directly experience in your job, it's massively constraining. Yeah. And so for me, uh, this principle, I will learn bigger than my job constantly, has been uh, a thing. And a quick underscore on that for those who haven't been in the military or haven't served in the FBI or at Customs Border Protection, uh, you don't have to have had that experience. Uh, Chris, just very briefly, I recall a study when you were at CIA and what was called the Directorate of Intelligence at that time. It's now called the Directorate of Analysis. Us old guys would say be happy when they changed the name back. But the DI or Directorate of Intelligence did a study on what makes for a good military analyst at CIA. And one of the big conclusions was it was just somebody who was a voracious reader, consumer, just intellectually curious in a voracious way about all things military topics. As you mentioned, how's a foreign military organized? What equipment does it have? What are the capabilities on that equipment? How do they think about operations? How are they operating? So we would just encourage uh, our community, read, learn, watch movies, talk to subject matter experts, but focus on your domain knowledge. Stay passionate about that. Okay, Chris, so let's pivot to a third area, and these the third and fourth area are squarely specific to AI. And let's start with AI projects. That's where the work gets done, and you grew up in your career leading projects first. Um, when you think about leading an AI project, um, what are some things that you would commend to our community in terms of strengthening their ability to lead AI projects? So uh, I would say, Frank, uh, be open to learning about new techniques for coming at problems. And in that, I would say having teams and multiple people looking at problems is really crucial. Uh, any given individual, me as an example, Right now, if you gave me a complex task to look at, I have a current set of tools that I'm comfortable to work with, and I have a current set of knowledge. And if the limit of the problem solving is to what I know how to do immediately, it's very constraining. So as a leader, I want to have a team, and I want to have a team think about different angles on that problem. What are different methods that can be used? How do we assess where they currently are, et cetera? But Multiple perspectives, I would say, is critical, and then being open to something new. Uh, so as an example for me, in 
2007, we were working and I was leading a multi-headed team that was looking at special operations forces activities in, in war zones. And we were encountering a lot of text. Uh, there was just a tremendous amount of text and we wanted to work from text to quantify. Well, there were some techniques that were becoming much more available and they were outgrowths of the R community, the Python community. And we had a couple of people who were really good MacGyverish problem solvers. And we worked together and we conceptualized ways to extract what we wanted out of that content with the tools that we had available in order to drive insights. But if I'd been left to that on my own, how would I have done it on my own? Would have been much more limited. And so I think as a, as a leader, team, multiple perspectives, be open to new. And then with the new, you got to be really savvy about how will it actually apply? What do I need to have? What is the compute going to have to look like, uh, et cetera? Because you can get caught up in really highly conceptual discussions. And, you know, it's like chat GPT right now. Everybody wants to talk about that. But the level of understanding of what is actually going on, very different kettle of fish. You want to make sure as an AI leader you're getting ideas on the table, but then you really are working them to the edge to understand, all right, what would this require? How would it work? How do we hypothesize it would work? Can we do it in this environment? That kind of thing, I would mm. say, is, is really important. Chris, I want to ask you about project methods or method and quality. But before I do that, let me just illustrate a reference that you make not infrequently that old farts like us know what you're talking about, but some of the younger folks may not. You referenced MacGyver uh, TV program from a ways back. Uh, this is uh, MacGyverish behavior. When we were processing all of that text from the war zone, we had us an individual, Rob Traster, shout out to you, Rob, uh, who was an expert in stat. Uh, just an expert in stat. Uh, we did not have cloud, obviously, in the 2006, 2007 time frame. Uh, and we were a small business. And, you know, we had roughly, let's call it 100 people. Uh, and we had a lot of desktop machines. But we didn't have the resources to go acquire uh, a lot of big computing, big iron. And Rob, on his own initiative, this would be an illustration of MacGyverish behavior. Uh, Rob networked uh, most of our desktop machines together, virtualized them, and basically gave us the compute capability uh, to overnight run these big jobs on this text. And when Chris says MacGyver, uh, that's a great illustration of uh, MacGyverish behavior. Uh, so, Chris. Yes. yes. How about project method or methods uh, where AI is concerned? You have always been, even in, you know, decades ago, working quantitative projects. You have always been a big advocate around having a method, having a methodological approach, having a quality approach to the work. What would you say there for leaders? Um, that there are options in doing that, but it's not an option to have. Uh, an expectation of <laughs> methods. If you run a business unit or you run a unit in uh, the government environment, I think the opposite of you, you do not want everybody approaching every task as if it's the first time that task has ever been done. And methods give us a way to generalize the approach to common or relatively common problems. And for a leader, they give handholds, right? Now I know, okay, we're in this phase of this project. How do I begin to interact around that with the team effectively, knowing that almost 100% of the time, you're going to have team members that know more than you about techniques, et cetera. You know, as the longer we've gone in career, the farther away you can get pulled from actual 
keyboard activities. So I've done things to refresh my understanding. I've taken courses in R, I've taken courses in Python. Fine, but I'm not doing it every day, right? And the people that are, are always going to be stronger. So from a, a team leadership perspective, uh, to me, you want handholds and the bigger an operation you run, the more you want standard methods because that gives leaders a set of expectations. You can begin to look towards not only the way that products are created, but the way that the work is done. And you can ask more effective questions about where the team is and iterating through the process. Uh, in the absence of standards, I don't even know what you have. Uh, you, you have a grab bag of best effort by individuals where I would have a very low expectation of the corporate output. Um, yeah, I, I think setting standards, having methods is key to uh, improving performance. Fast path to having quality problems in the delivery if you don't have a standardized approach that you train people to and hold them accountable to. So, And it's hard. Some environments resist that. Some environments resist that. And, and I would say this is an area where, you know, at some level, we all do analysis all the time, right? We, we analyze our personal financial situation. We analyze uh, buying options in, in our life. And so it's easy to convert that to work and say, well, I, I can do any of that and I'll just do it the way I instinctively analyze anything. Not a best practice. Yeah. Uh, and especially as that pertains to data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you want to bring structure to those projects in their phases and you want to have an expectation of observable items that you're going to engage your team around or inspectable items that you're going to engage your, your team around. And in the absence of that, you're kind of relying on luck. Uh, I hope it's all going to go well. I've got smart people working the job and I just, from my experience, uh, that's far from good enough. Mm. Smart people make mistakes. Individuals make mistakes. Teams can make mistakes. And if you're not engaged as a leader, uh, using a method and having a methodological way to approach these things, yeah, you you can you can render the ground fertile for big mistakes, and it's you doing it effectively yeah. because yeah. you're allowing it to happen. Yeah. Um. There are a number of published uh, methods that you can find, project approaches, one called CRISP, C-R-I-S-P dash D-M. I'll spare you the long acronym breakout, but you can go and learn more about CRISP DM. Uh, we have one, if you go to the bottom of our website, AILeaders.com, we have a free resource on a project, AI project approach that covers what we have found to be the missing activity in all published AI projects. So if you go to our bottom of our website, AIleaders.com, you can get hands on that. But there are a lot of project approaches, what Chris said in the beginning. Um, there are options, but it's not optional to pick one, train your people on it, and use it. Okay, Chris, let's pivot to fourth area, AI program leadership. Uh, how is program leadership different? And let's just talk a little bit about your experience, things that you think are important for leaders in leading AI programs. First, I would contextualize this around the domain. Um, AI is inherently decentralized in the way it gets executed. So very, very many programs may have an AI component while they are primarily oriented to something else. Uh, and then there are certain centralized analytic or AI centered activities that are present in the government and in industry. Uh, we'll deal with the latter one first. So I've worked in several where the purpose of the organization inside an enterprise is to provide an analytics to include potentially machine learning and AI elements 
to other offices in the enterprise. Uh, multiple will have that. Um, what's crucial in those environments to me uh, from a leadership perspective is understanding that you're a service provider, not a long-term solution provider. In the federal government, long-term, Enduring capabilities are represented in technological programs. And these centers that get created, uh, focused activities in an enterprise, they're not building IT solutions. They're uh, exploratory in nature. They may be research in nature. They may develop models that have pertinence. But you got to get that into some other capability that is enduring in its focus. And managing that process is really important if that's your role. If, if you are in the acquisition side, so you're in a system program office, you are in a program executive office or a program in the national security space, the challenge for you as a leader is to identify the places where AI can be integrated to improve performance. That may be on an established area where you have current key performance indicators and, and metrics where you're underperforming and AI might improve it, or it may be an entire enhancement in your program environment. You can add something that you have not been doing by leveraging data. What's challenging for leaders there is see and conceptualize the AI integration point and then effectively resource it or negotiate, go to the meaning you've got to engage in the legislative process and make sure you have the resourcing to do what you need. Uh, those are big things, I think, for the two big forms of uh, leadership at that level. These centers or centralized activities that can provide services in the enterprise or uh, an established program, an enduring capability where AI needs to be integrated. Uh, how do you do that? Those are the big challenges to me. Fantastic. Chris, I'll just chip in one last one there. If you're an, a leader, a senior leader in a dedicated AI activity, so Chris talked about AI integrated into a system program where the system program is not just AI, it could be a command and control, it could be a case management system, it could be an HR system, et cetera. But if you're a leader in what is predominantly an AI activity, as a senior leader, the other thing you need to do is develop subordinate leaders. If you're in an AI program, you're going to have multiple projects running, you're gonna have multiple project leaders, and it is your responsibility to develop them. Uh, and it is not a body of common sense, as we've just outlined here uh, and has been demonstrated in other tech innovations like software. Uh, those of us who are around when kind of software became, you know, ascendant uh, in the late 80s, early 2000s, and programs were largely about wrapping hardware around software, but the, the kernel of the system was software. And we found that smart technical people with no training and leading a software program were running the programs in the ditch regularly. And we kind of had a safety stand down and had a big body of training on software program management. So it's not common sense. It's your responsibility as a senior leader to develop other leaders. So really encouragement on sharpening yourself. You know, one last thought there, Frank, and I, I do think this is pertinent. It's just continuing to cultivate some sense of realistic expectation around what these advanced capabilities, mm. machine learning and yeah, AI yeah. can do. It's so prone uh, to hype and dismissiveness and leaders have, leaders have to set the tone on that and leaders have to make sure the mechanisms are in place for people to increasingly build awareness each individual, you got to do it on your own, right? You got to put the shovel in the ground. But I think for leaders, it's important. Um, I'm remembering people that I have supported and you're dealing with organizations, you know, in your enterprise that may have desires. They may have requirements. They may have things that they want to nurture as needs. 
those are not necessarily always going to be realistically grounded. Uh, and, and especially when it comes to what's viable cost wise to create a sustained capability. Uh, it's easy to conceptualize certain things. Uh, you know, an idea is not a plan. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a far distance from an enduring capability and enduring technology capability. So mm -hmm. uh, leaders have to navigate that. Cool. So, Chris, let's finish up briefly with just a fifth area here that will be surprising, I think, to many to include data science and AI practitioners. You have led advanced analytics and AI from the standpoint of consultancies. Uh, Booz Allen, we started a consultancy, an analytics consultancy, Edge Consulting, IBM, Deloitte. Um, what is it about management consulting? What elements of management consulting do you think are helpful to AI leaders and would encourage people to develop a skill in those areas? Uh, the consultative process, you know, fundamentally people use consultants where they do not have the organizational capacity. And that means I've got people aligned to jobs and I'm sized to run an operation, but I'm a senior leader and I realize I've got to have change occur. So I'm trading off between running the railroad, running operations and getting change to happen. And this management consulting is an aspect of that change activity. And it can be much disparaged at times uh, and in certain quarters, but the consultative process really identifying problems, framing a structured approach to move them. Uh, I remember I, I had a departure from the intelligence community and national security for a period early in the 2000s. And uh, there was a man named Charles Rosati who was the commissioner of the IRS. And I did a stint where I was supporting that. But it was a gigantic, gigantic organizational change. Um, the entirety of that service was being uh, fundamentally reorganized and the technology refreshed or big elements of it. Well, when you start that, you know, it's this colossus as a problem it was fascinating to me as a leader in that environment, not the leader, a leader, just to see how is that even structured when you have a stopwatch running and you're trying to do that. And what struck me in that environment and in some commercial environments where I was consulting as part of teams, the experts, the people that I ultimately looked at and said, Ooh, I would like to be like that. They were very knowledgeable in their domains, so they learned the client domains that they served, and then they had a kit bag full of techniques for looking at different problems. And in effect, and some people have written about this, it's a little bit of like being a doctor you, you're trying to diagnose where an organization is and the class of problem that it's running into because there are not an infinite range of major solutions. And I loved that. I thought that part of the consulting environment was great. Uh, and I do think there is, we've already talked about, there is value in structuring your thinking around how to approach change challenges like that. And that's very stitched into the consulting environment. And it's, it's less so in operations. And the value you get out of management consulting is those companies are seeing a lot of problems year over year. And they are purposefully, for business reasons, trying to generalize the useful approaches out of that and generalize the learning. I love that. that. That was great. And that process is very useful. It's hard to do if your role is running the railroad and a particular part of the railroad. Mm. You're going to be an expert in the mission. You're likely an expert leader if you're in that. But navigating change uh, that's an adjoining issue and yeah, management consultants can be helpful mm -hmm. on that score. 
plenty of books out there, plenty of talks plenty. out there on this front. Plenty. Peter Block, Flawless Consulting is one that sort of gets to the blocking and tackling of the consultative process, but there are plenty of resources you can find. I would also say, Chris, the best consultants, and you and I have tried to uh, represent this uh, throughout our careers to include now, the best consultants are excellent storytellers. And whether you are viewing AI as code, which we do fundamentally, an AI model, a supervised machine learning algorithm, et cetera, models get instantiated in code. But as you are doing that from starting the project to delivery, you're interacting with stakeholders and you are telling stories. And to be able to be a good storyteller is part of the consultative tool bag. And so just sharpening your storytelling ability, we would commend. So Chris, thank you for doing this. Uh, if I were to help our community just get to know you a little bit better, uh, this has been extraordinarily uncomfortable <laughs> for you. But um, we have done it because you are a good example, not only because of the numerous uh, awards and impact uh, awards and recognition, but the impact you have had in so many places, but also just a very good example, because again, as you articulated, you were one of those people coming out of mission. You came out of the army, you came out of, out of CIA. Um, you, you weren't even, you know, a hardcore quantitative analyst at that point. And you have developed yourself. You're just a great illustration. Uh, and I think you would echo people can learn to lead in this area. Yes. Oh, uh, have to learn and can learn. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. And if 100%. we think national security enterprise, you know, even more so federal government, we need tens and tens of thousands of people to learn to lead this. Uh, so we have made courses available. We call it the AI Leadership Stack. Uh, there are two courses that are focused on project leadership and senior leadership, read program leadership. Uh, there is a mastery level course that is called the AI Leaders course. And then there's a course AI for everyone, uh, because we believe given that AI is a general purpose technology and it is going to touch pretty much every mission area, every mission enabling capability in national security and in the government, that everyone needs to have more than awareness and certainly more than the hype or the hand wringing. And there's a $99 course uh, AI for everyone. So that's out there at AIleaders.com. Uh, we have coming up a webinar. We'll announce more about the date uh, coming up, but Chris and I are going to conduct a webinar, a live webinar uh, on large language models in chat GPT. Uh, as you heard in the beginning of this, there are just some bad mistakes that are being made that can be avoided by you and by your organization, and you can teach others uh, by just being equipped with a foundational set of knowledge of how these models work, what their strengths and caution should be, uh, what you can be certain of right now in terms of performance, areas of uncertainty, uh, use cases, uh, we're going to cover examples. So we're going to do uh, a webinar sometime in the middle of uh, June. So just stay tuned for more uh, information on that. Uh, we hope this has been helpful to you. We hope it has been encouraging to you as you develop yourself as an AI leader, whether you are one of those non-AI practitioner types that uh, Chris exemplifies, or if you're an AI practitioner, a data science, software engineer, computer scientist, et cetera, uh, we hope this information has been helpful to you and the resources we provide are helpful. Uh, please uh, give this episode, if you're watching on YouTube, a like, subscribe to our channel, rate and review on Apple and Spotify. It helps to get the word out. By doing that, you're not complimenting us. You're helping to get the word out because, as we said, we need tens of thousands of people trained in this area. So thank you for tuning in. Until next time, appreciate you. Indeed.